Hello, hello. Welcome. Uh, I'm going to wait just for a few seconds for people as they log on here. Uh, there are literally a few hundred people who've signed up. I'm so excited. Uh, so uh, while we wait, let me just take a minute to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Tyler Zock. Uh, I'm a three wing four. I'm a local pastor right here in Omaha, Nebraska. I have a beautiful wife named Lindsay. She's a six wing seven, but really, uh, we all know she's a perfect 10, right? Uh, and I have two adopted boys, nine and 11, and uh, I'm a certified Enneagram coach and author of the Enneagram devotional series. Uh, so I've embarked on a five-year journey to write a 40-day devotional for all nine Enneagram types. And so, so far, I've written books for type one, two, three, four, six, and nine. I know it's a bit random. I haven't been going in order, uh, but that type two book comes out on Thanksgiving weekend, 2022. And then in the next year, I'll finish up types five, seven, and eight. So you can find those books on Amazon uh, or just go to my website, gospel That's been a, a tremendously fun and life-giving project. And so thanks for letting me share uh, that with you. Okay, so now that a few more people have joined us, uh, I want to officially welcome you all to the webinar. This is my first uh, webinar, and so first of many, I hope, uh, to keep bringing you valuable content for free. So I'm so glad you could join me, whether you're watching from your office desk uh, or, at, you know, or at home with kids running around or at a coffee shop, wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, thank you for showing up. Uh, I don't think you are going to be disappointed. All right, so let's, let's uh, ask the question, right? Should Christians use the Enneagram? Like that is the question. You guys, as the Enneagram continues to grow in popularity, there is a bigger target on its back. Uh, I've gotten a lot of heat recently. Some of you have as well. Uh, there's more and more videos coming out on YouTube of people making arguments against the Enneagram. Uh, have you been approached by a pastor, by a friend, by a family member who has said, why are you using that thing? Uh, you know, has anyone sent you a link to a video, video or article about how the Enneagram came from spirits or occult sources? And you just don't know how to respond, right? And then it made you think, well, should I be learning the Enneagram? Should I be discussing it with anyone? Or should I be teaching the Enneagram? Should I be a coach? Well, keep watching because you are at the right place to get some answers, okay? I myself have had all the doubts and all the fears and all the concerns that you have or have had, okay? I'm with you. And that's why uh, it led me to study the history a few years ago. You know, I wanted to make sure that as a Christian and as especially as a pastor, I could use the Enneagram with a clear conscience. That led me to write a short ebook, a PDF, called Should Christians Use the Enneagram, uh, which you can actually download on my website, gospel But some of you have read that, and I'm, I'm here to say that a lot of the content today is going to be brand new and is not in that article, all right? Uh, because this past summer, I felt like I needed to go on an even deeper dive into the history to really get to the bottom of some of the objections that I was hearing. And from that deep dive, I thought to myself, I have to create an e-course to take people on a journey of showing them what I found. Because what I found brought me more clarity and it brought me more confidence to use the Enneagram. And uh, as a precursor to that e-course, uh, I decided to take some highlights from that e-course and turn it into a webinar and to share sort of a high-level view of some of these objections, uh, some of these myths or myths under um, misunderstandings that people have about the Enneagram, okay? Uh, so here is what we are going to uh, talk about today. The modern Enneagram is based on the pentagram. The modern Enneagram is ancient. The modern Enneagram is a Christian tool. The modern Enneagram is a Sufi tool. The modern Enneagram is based on astrology. The modern Enneagram is based on numerology. Uh, the modern Enneagram came from an archangel, or spirits, uh, and the modern Enneagram is not scientifically validated. How many of you have heard uh, any of those before? Okay, and uh, listen, I know that I'm perfect. I may, may, might make some mistakes. Um, I'm doing the best that I can to present research to you, and then you can make an, an informed decision and, or go research yourself. Uh, and I'm open. If anybody 
and wants to challenge anything that I say or has any more insight or pushback, I would love uh, to continue to sharpen some of these arguments. But uh, I do think that some of these arguments make sense to me, and I hope they make sense uh, to you to give you some more clarity and confidence in using the Enneagram. Um, okay, so the first sort of myth uh, or objection is the easiest to counter, and that is that the modern Enneagram is based on the pentagram, all right? Uh, so how, how many of you have heard that? All right, this one is the easiest to debunk because penta in pentagram means five. The ennea in the enneagram means nine. So they are totally two different shapes. There's only a few, <laughs> there's only one way that you can draw each of these shapes. So I'm sorry to disappoint the naysayers here, but the enneagram was not uh, created by Satanists who want to recruit you to worship the devil. Okay, that's not who enneagram teachers are. Uh, the pentagram and enneagram are just two different shapes, two different symbols. They have nothing in common okay uh the next objection is that the modern enneagram is ancient now there are a lot of enneagram teachers that i highly respect that have been teaching a lot, lot longer than i have who claim that the enneagram is ancient okay and from the research that i've done though my answer is that the modern enneagram that we have right the the system that we've learned and teach is not ancient but draws from ancient sources okay and because it draws from ancient sources it could be confused as ancient so for example there's a guy by the name of uh of evagrius on evagrius uh or evagrius is probably the right, right way to say it uh, was one of the desert fathers and he is it is said that he interviewed his fellow monks about the obstacles they encountered while meditating and based on these interviews, he developed a system of self-knowledge which relied on categories, categorizing various forms of temptation. And so he identified and defined eight patterns of evil thought in his treatise called On the Vices Opposed to the Virtues. So let me just show you what those look like here. So he had gluttony and abstinence, which co correlates to type 7, uh, fornication and chastity, like lust, which correlates to type eight, uh, avarice and freedom from possessions, uh, which correlates to type five, sadness and joy, which you could correlate to type four, anger and patience, which you could correlate to type one, um, acedia and perseverance, which you could correlate to type nine, vainglory and freedom from vainglory, uh, type three, and then lastly, pride and humility, which you could correlate to two, and then that's, it's missing one. Um, but this so this is an example of seeing a lot of similarities, right, to the vices and the virtues that we have in our modern Enneagram. And so it, you, as you look at this example, you might begin to sus suspect that the Enneagram, in fact, is ancient because, look, there's so many similarities, right? And in my e-course, my Enneagram Origins e-course, uh, I'm going to have a lot more time to discuss uh, other ancient influences like this one. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Raymond Lowell, uh, whose nine-point diagram looks a lot like the Enneagram we have. Uh, there's a lot of similarities. Uh, and he also used the diagram to provide a path, a growth path, on moving from our vices to virtues. Okay, so that sounds very familiar. Um, and then also, I'm going to look at Athanasius, Athanasius Kircher, uh, whose diagram looks eerily similar uh, to the one we have now. So now, while well, many of these influences show up in our modern Enneagram, they don't prove, though, that the Enneagram system as a whole that we have today, uh, or the majority of it, was passed down from generation to generation. Right? That is just speculation, and we don't have any proof of it. But if you keep listening, I think you'll understand more and more why you know I think the Enneagram is modern and is not ancient. So that leads me to the next objection or myth and that is that the modern enneagram is a christian tool okay uh because we can see how the work of evagrius the desert father and monk as well as raymond lowell who we just saw who's another franciscan monk uh show up in the modern enneagram uh because we can sh because we can see how their work showed up in it it's easy to think that the enneagram could be christian based right um 
But like I said before, I don't see any evidence of a system as a whole being passed down from generation to generation. Right. And I think the danger in claiming that the Enneagram is a Christian tool is not advantageous because then as Christians, we have to sort of defend all the aspects of the Enneagram and defend it as a Christian tool when I don't think we need to. But right? I've seen people pick apart the different aspects of the Enneagram, right? Jesuits and others uh, who pick it apart and who turn against it and say that it's not Christian. And I'm like, I agree. <laughs> Just like with any tool, there are parts that we can affirm and parts that we can challenge. Uh, similarly, I've seen people reject the Enneagram because so-and-so person teaches the Enneagram and they claim to be Christians and their theology or their worldview is problematic. But that's just throwing the baby out with the bathwater, right? There are pastors and even books in the Christian bookstore that don't have good theology. Right? Does that mean that we throw out truth or throw out the Bible? No. Okay. Uh, so getting back to the question, if we look at the facts available, all the evidence points to the fact that the modern Enneagram that we have was the product of the 1960s by a man named Oscar Ichazo. And from his work and his own direct quotes, I believe that we can see that the Enneagram is not a Christian tool nor a Sufi tool for that matter, uh, which leads us to the next myth that the modern Enneagram is a Sufi tool. So let's deal with that objection. Okay. Um, so let me give some more context here about, the guy named Ichazo. Right? Ichazo was born in Bolivia and raised there and in Peru, but as a young man moved to Buenos Aires, Argentina, to learn from a school of inner work that he had encountered. And then afterward, he journeyed in Asia, gathering other knowledge before returning back to South America to begin putting together a systematic approach to all that he had learned. And in 1956, he traveled to Central Asia and this is where many people think he learned the Enneagram from the Sufis. But it was not a pilgrimage where he pumped the Sufis for Enneagram knowledge, like many people seem to think, or have you've heard, but rather it was the other way around. Right? The Sufis were curious, curiously asking Oscar Echazo all kinds of questions about what he was learning. And we know this because Echazo himself said so. Right? And after many years of continuing to develop his ideas, uh, he created what's called the Eureka School in 1956 as sort of a, a vehicle for transmitting his knowledge of psychology and personality. And over a decade later, in 1968, Echazo started presenting lectures on his theories um, at the Institute of Applied Psychology in Santiago, Chile. Okay, Now, I want to clarify something here that's a really big deal. Okay, so listen up. Uh, many people think that Achazo inherited the Enneagram or the whole Enneagram system uh, from a guy by the name of, of George Gurdjieff, uh, who lived from 1866 to 1949. Gurdjieff was an Armenian philosopher and a mystic who was said to be an Eastern Orthodox esoteric Christian. <laughs> uh, whatever that is, I, I don't know <laughs> uh, what that means, but uh, that's what I've read. Uh, Gurdjieff initially presented the Enneagram figure to his Russian students in Moscow and then St. Petersburg in 1916. And so one of his students, but Gurdjieff never wrote about anything publicly, but Gurdjieff, uh, one of Gurdjieff's students, P.D. Ospensky, I hope I get that right, released a book that talked about Gurdjieff's Enneagram symbol and beliefs. And so this was the first time in history that the Enneagram shows up. Uh, any sort of recorded literature that, that would make us aware of the Enneagram. And so a lot of people think that Gurdjieff is the one who inherited this system, that the Enneagram system that had been transferred down from the, uh, generation to generation and then passed it off to Echazo. Um, but <laughs> Echazo did not receive an entire Enneagram system from Gurdjieff. So what did Echazo get from Gurdjieff. Well, he got two things, um, two main things. For starters, he got the nine-point Enneagram symbol that we've all seen, right? That that symbol uh, came from Gurdjieff, who developed, de developed himself or got it from somebody else, okay? Uh, and then also we get the triads um, from Gurdjieff. I don't believe he called it that, but that's what we got. 
So he taught that we are all three-brained beings, that we all have three centers of intelligence, mental, seeing, emotional, feeling, and body instinct, sensing. So the current Enneagram model mirrors these categories with head, heart, and body centers or triads. And so each of those represent one way of knowing. But Gurdjieff, uh, which I appreciate, uh, he, he had a teaching called the fourth way, and it was to develop all three centers, uh, head, heart, and body all at the same time. So that should be very familiar to anyone who studied the Enneagram and has learned it because uh, we talk about the triads quite a bit. Uh, so he got the symbol and he got the triads or the centers of intelligence from Gurdjieff. Okay? And it's also helpful to know that Gurdjieff did not create the Enneagram symbol as a personality tool. Okay, let, the, let that sink in for a moment. Gurdjieff did not create the Enneagram symbol, the symbol that you can see on the screen there, uh, as a personality tool. The closest it ever got to being a personality tool was when he created a chief feature on all the ni around all the nine points. Okay, but even then, um, Ichaso did not use Gurdjieff's chief features on his Enneagram. So Gurdjieff's chief features does, did not translate to what we have today. Okay, so I can't overstate this enough that Gurdjieff's Enneagram symbol was actually a symbol to understand all of life, right? He used it as a template or blueprint to understand everything, uh, including musical octaves and other such things. And so you can see that there on the screen that he was putting musical octaves around the Enneagram. And that's why, and this is another big deal, right? Achazo never called it the Enneagram. Achazo never called it the Enneagram. He called it the Enneagon. Uh, which was a more generic nine-point diagram. And Achazo says that this didn't come from Gurdjieff, but this actually came back from Pythagoras in, early, early on uh, in ancient history. So he didn't call it the Enneagram because the Enneagram was Gurdjieff's symbol to interpret all of life. So Achazo's personality insights, uh, what he did was he took his personality insights and laid them over this nine-point Enneagon or Enneagram diagram, and he taught that in his Eureka school. Uh, and it was original to him, right? It wasn't passed down. And this is, in my research, this is what I found Echazo saying and Echazo claiming. So in Echazo's letter to the transpersonal community, it's a long a name for a letter, uh, Echazo said this. He said, I did not receive the Eureka theory, right? His theory of proto-analysis of taking personality insights and applying them on, on the symbol. He said, I did not receive the Ricky theory from, from some obscure Sufi sect. Like that's, that's what most people have said that he got it from the Sufis uh, or Gurdjieff got it from the Sufis. He said, I did not receive it from some obscure Sufi sect or from anybody else. The Eureka theory and method are directly and completely proposed and presented exclusively by me. I am the source of the Eureka theory and method. Okay pretty bold statement there, right? Uh, and in an article uh, by Michael Goldberg in, called Inside the Enneagram Wars, uh, he interviewed Echazo. And again, Echazo once again refutes the claim that the Enneagram has Sufi origins, okay? He says, I know Sufi Sufism extensively. I've practiced traditional zakur, prayer, meditation, and I know realized Sufi sheiks. It is not part of their theoretical framework. They couldn't care less about the Enneagon. Okay. So all that, all that to say, the fears that some Christians have about the Sufi connection, that it's been passed on through an Islamic or even a cultist tradition, uh, just isn't true. Right. The reality is that the Enneagram, as we have it today, is fundamentally a theory about her human personality started in the 1960s by Echazo, which we can use in any context regardless of religious beliefs okay all right uh let's keep moving the next uh, myth is that the modern enneagram is based on astrology okay if achazo is the one who came up with the modern enneagram then did he um <clears throat> excuse me did he uh, use astrology or astrological science in creating it 
The answer is no. And Echazo himself said he didn't. And I have provided some quotes about this in my, my e-course. Uh, but there have been a few people who have tried to correlate the Enneagram with astrology. So one of them is a guy by the name of Rodney Collins. Uh, so he wrote a book in 1954 who over, he overlaid astrological signs onto the Enneagram diagram. Another person who attempted to do this more recently is Helen Palmer. And so if you're an Enneagram novice and you don't know much about the Enneagram, you might be intrigued by some of their correlations and be like, wow, there, there are some similarities there between some of the signs and the Enneagram types. But if you study the Enneagram or for a long time or are a coach, you'll notice right away if you read uh, what they've written, you'll read that there's a lot of differences between the astrological signs and the Enneagram types. Okay. I think that you'll find Palmer and Collins correlations uh, to be a huge, huge stretch. Okay. And in, in addition, what makes the Enneagram different from astrology is that astrology tells you who you are or what will happen, right? Your fortune uh, based on when you were born, your birth date. And you are this because of when you were born. But the Enneagram invites you to explore how God created you and what your core desires and your, your core fears are. Watch this as you self verify your type. Okay. An Enneagram coach or an Enneagram test doesn't tell you uh, who you are based on your birth date. Okay. They present the facts and present the patterns and the types, and then you self verify. Okay. It's not your personality is not dependent upon your birth date. Uh, additionally, astrology is primarily about the future, right? To help you find out what's going to happen. That's why so many people are drawn to it because they want to know what's next, what's going to happen in their life. But the Enneagram is about what's true in the present, right? It's not about predicting your future. And that's why I say that astrology is about fortune telling, but the Enneagram is about formation, all right? Um, and lastly, I found astrology to be a lot more vague and generalized, whereas the Enneagram is a lot more specific, right? Here's your core sin. Here's your core desire. Here's your core fear, okay? It's very concrete. Again, very different. All right, and, and that kind of leads me into the next uh, myth, and that is that the Enneagram is based on numerology, and I can, I can see why some people would think that, and we'll find out here why in a little bit, but backing up to give some context, generally speaking, uh, numerology is similar to astrology in that it looks for some data to make projections about what the future holds for you, right, but numerology doesn't just look at your birthday, but also your name. And once you provide your name, and I've tested this out, I went to a numerology website, uh, you give them your name, and then it assigns numerical values to the letters, the, the alphabet. Um, uh, and so it assigns numerical letters to, numerical uh, values to your letters. And so why would you want to find a numerical value? Well, because numer numerology says that all of nature can be explained in mathematical expressions, right? From the way that the world was created, to the behavior of water, to the effects of gravity. Mathematics describes every single thing in our universe, okay? And, you know, this sounds a little crazy, but in my e-course, I talk about how Christians and even Augustine uh, were influenced by Jewish mysticism and really took a lot of stock in numbers, even numbers in the Bible, okay? So this is something that Christians and non-Christians were doing uh, early on, uh, because they believed that, you know, uh, math, that, that God wired the world in a certain way. And then if you could understand math, then you could understand us and what's going to happen. Okay. But the Enneagram is different from numerology in that it doesn't tell you who you are based on your birth date, like astrology, nor does it tell you who you are based on the letters of your name, right? In the Enneagram, the numbers one through nine on, um, on the symbol are just there to label and identify each of the nine types. That again, you read through, you choose yourself, and then you self-verify, okay? So where does, um, let's go back here, where does most of the worry and concern come from? Well, it comes from the fact that the inner lines and arrows of the Enneagram symbol were developed using math, okay? Either by Gurdjieff or whoever he got the symbol from. Okay, and I don't have time today to get into the math right now, 
uh, he takes you know one divided by seven. It's called the law of seven, and uses that that um, result to create this pattern of the inner lines that we see in the enneagram. And again, I don't have time to get into the math right now. This is something that will go into depth uh, in my enneagram origins course. Uh, we'll walk through the math and and see how you know why the the arrow goes from type two to type eight and so on. But to keep things simple for now, I want to remind you that the lines and arrows in the Enneagram were created before there were personality types. You think about that. The lines and arrows of the Enneagram were created before there were even personality types. Okay. All that Gurdjieff was trying to do, or whoever was came up with the symbol before him, all they were trying to do was to communicate that the human growth is dynamic. Okay. We can appreciate that. He was all about like life is motion. We, we don't grow standing still, but we are moving. We are going somewhere. And that's what's beautiful about the Enneagram is that it's dynamic. It shows you where you can go in health and in unhealth. And you don't just stay in one spot. Okay. So when Naranjo was working with the symbol later on, he took this idea of movement from the arrows and thought to himself, um, and I'm speculating that Naranjo did this and not Ichazo, um, but I could be wrong. But uh, he was he was speculating, okay, how does a type 2 look like uh, a type 8 when they are stressed? Okay, and, and how does a type 8 look like a type 2 when they are in security? And then things got written down uh, of what it looks like for a 2 to go to an 8 and become aggressive uh, on that arrow. Now, as you know, if you've been around the Enneagram, uh, I think his insights in his, from his observation are brilliant and very accurate. Like as a three, when I go to nine in unhealth, uh, or my ego is stressed and go to nine, or when I'm in security and, and go to, to six, right? Some of the observations the Enneagram has shown me has been really, really helpful. Okay. And so here's how, in a nutshell, I would approach this from a Christian uh, perspective. Okay. So, first of all, let's realize that the Enneagram would be like numerology if you gave me your name and I said, you know, because your name is Sarah, for example, uh, for sure, because you're Sarah as, I, Sarah, as I dissect your name, that means you're a type two. And the lines and arrows determined by a math formula say that you're going to become a four uh, in your future. Uh, that's what you can expect as your fortune, right? That's what would it sound like if the Enneagram was like numerology. Okay, but that's not what's going on here. Right. Once again, you choose the type that resonates with you. You self-verify it. And then the Enneagram shows you some of the characteristics of another number that you can grow into. It doesn't say that fate will make you a different personality type. Right. It says that you'll take on a few characteristics of another type. Like, right, makes, makes sense? Um, and second of all, just remember to hold this growth map loosely. Okay. The Enneagram symbol is not the Bible. Uh, so don't say that the arrows and lines are the only places you can go in stress or security, right? I think we could say that you could take on some healthy or unhealthy characteristics of any personality type as you look at anybody in your family or group of friends, right? But, the, but I do think that the lines and arrows of the Enneagram uh, give us a starting point, a starting place to begin our growth process, okay? Um, I hope that that makes sense. That didn't get too... Uh, too heady there. Uh, I'm just trying to say you could theoretically draw a line to every single number, but then the Enneagram would be just so complex. I mean, there'd be lines going everywhere, and then it'd be really hard to know where to start on your journey. But I think the Enneagram, the way it's laid out, uh, is helpful and simple to me. Okay. All right. So moving on to the next myth, and that is that the modern Enneagram came from an archangel, archangel or spirits. Right. In, in Joe Carter's article on the Gospel Coalition website, uh, I read this. It said, Achazo claimed to have discovered the personality type meaning of the Enneagram when it was taught to him by the archangel Metatron. Sounds like a transformer, doesn't it? Uh, but he got it from Metatron while he was high on mescaline. Okay, so he cites his source from a 2000 article uh, called A Brief Report on the Origins of the Enneagram, which... Uh, was in the National Catholic Reporter. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen this claim show up on websites, YouTube videos, et cetera. And it really concerned me for a long time. 
I didn't know what to tell people. This past summer, I was like, let's get to the bottom of this and, and see what we can find. So I read through Chazo's letter to the transpersonal community, uh, all 40 pages of it. And in that letter, he just comes out right out and says publicly, or this is a letter that was distributed pub publicly. And he said he did not, in fact, receive the Enneagram from Metatron or any angel or divine source. So this is just a rumor, right? Chazo claimed himself uh, that everything he did based on the Enneagram was on scientific observation. And so if someone tells you that, just tell them that Achazo himself refuted that claim and that it is uh, just a rumor, okay? Okay, um, I want to talk about Claudio Naranjo, who we haven't talked about much. And to step back and give you some context, Naranjo was born in 1932. He was a Chilean psychiatrist and the inventor of the Enneagram Enneatypes, okay? He's the first one to say that point one on Achazo's diagram right, is a type one, or that point two is a type two. So he took Echazo's work and developed it into what we have today. And one interesting note is that Naranjo, like Echazo, never called the Enneagram the Enneagram. Why? Because he too knew that Gurdjieff's symbol was a universal symbol and not specifically created for personality types. So he called the Enneagram the psychology of Enneatypes, okay? That's made me think about whether or not I should rebrand a gospel for Enneagram uh, he, because he called it the psychology of Enneatypes. Uh, and when the Enneagram was leaked to the public later on through Naranjo students, okay? So he brought a bunch of students from the U.S. down to learn, it, learn the Enneagram from Echazo. Uh, and then, you know, some of those were Jesuits and Helen Palmer and some others like that. And uh, his, so his students, when they leaked the Enneagram, and they started to write books on the Enneagram. They called it the Enneagram. So even though Naranjo didn't like the term, it was his students and their books and resources that made us start using the name Enneagram later. So just a fun, fun fact there. Um, now, one of the major objections uh, to the Enneagram that I've heard, if not the biggest, most common objection, is the claim that the Enneagram came from automatic writing. So in a June 2010 interview, Naranjo states that he did in fact get the Enneatypes through automatic writing. So at first glance, this was very shocking for me when I was a Christian. I saw this for the first time. And I hadn't heard it before and had no context. I didn't know what to think. It sounded strange, you know? Uh, so I looked up automatic writing and it's basically the new age form of Christian practice, the Christian practice of prayer and meditation, right? It's, it's quieting your mind and trying to channel information from your subconscious or from a spirit. It could be either one. If you go Google right now, you'll get all kinds of, of different, um, opinions or practices. Just like if you typed in prayer into Google or meditation or even Christian meditation, you'd get all kinds of um, different stuff that show up. Okay. But basically it's like quieting your mind and, and trying to channel uh, information and it can come from within. It's like a, a, med a personal meditation or it could be people trying to listen to spirits. So as Christians, what do we do with this claim? Okay. It's a, it's a pretty significant claim. So here's my thought process, okay? First, we don't know what he meant, Naranjo meant by automatic writing, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that he got it from spirits. He never said spirits specifically, and that's a big deal, right? To, to say that the Enneagram came from spirits decisively and to say that with confidence is just a guess because Naranjo didn't say that, right? Automatic writing means different things to different people, okay? So I don't get it when people use that one statement that's off the cuff and just totally and completely throw the, the baby out with the bathwater. Okay. Second, I think that Naranjo is using the term automatic writing as a turn of phrase, right? And a, a quick expression for meditative writing, right? The, the, this comment that he said was just off the cuff and he had never said it before, right? Think about it. Uh, if you, if you got the any types uh, from a spirit, okay? You think that you would 
begin to tell people that early on or describe that, that powerful experience. But, but watch this. In, in 40 years, right, 40 years of teaching the Enneagram, not once did he explain that he got the, the Enneatypes from a spirit or some divine revelation. Not once. Uh, and and uh, Enneagram expert Beatrice Chestnut has, has said that. Like if she's been around his teaching. Not once did he ever talk about that. Right. So, so getting the Enneagram from a spirit, I think would be more believable if the Enneatypes would have been brand new, like out of thin air, you know, like Moses receiving the 10 commandments or Joseph Smith receiving a revelation, but that is not what happened. Okay. If you just look at the facts, okay. Naranjo studied psychology at Ivy league schools in the United States. And we have evidence that he took a, much of what he learned from Achazo. In his books, he's always quoting Achazo. And he started to overlay his insights from Sigmund Freud, Carl Jung, and others. And so in my origins class, I give specific examples of who he inherited a lot of his information from. He lists it right there in the books, and I have his books uh, on Kindle, and I've read them. Right, So you can see that Naranjo didn't just get the any types out of thin air. Okay, He learned much of what he knew from Achazo, uh, and then studied at prestigious U.S. schools that were on the leading edge of personality insights and personality study. Uh, he went to Harvard. He went to Berkeley. Uh, like, he was well-trained, okay? Uh, so perhaps Nerano, okay, if we think about it, from his own spiritual views, we know he was into New Age practices and a whole lot of other things. Uh, perhaps from his own spiritual perspective, he made the claim about automatic writing as an attempt to do what many Christians do, right? Many Christians back up their work by saying, hey, I heard from God or God showed me X, Y, and Z, right? When, we, when Christians do this, it makes our books or our sermons have a lot more weight to it, right? When we go on retreats and we come back and we have this direction in our lives and we, uh, we have more knowledge from the spirit, like right? we tell people that, like I felt led by the spirit, Right. So Naranjo, I think, could very well be doing this from his own spiritual beliefs, like trying to get across the fact that he believed that his knowledge is not just knowledge, but came from a deep spiritual place of inspiration. So it has more weight behind it, right? And, and even if he believes that, it doesn't necessarily mean that he did, in fact, get it from a spirit, right? The, the, all the evidence shows that he was well-trained uh, in the area of personality and that he did not get it out of thin air, right? Um, even if he thinks that he got it from some divine source, right? He was an Ivy League um, studied, trained psychologist. He was a medical doctor, like he knew his stuff. And so it's much more plausible to think that he just uh, practiced a, some a meditative writing uh, to get what he knew on paper as he was developing the Enneatypes, okay? So now the final myth and objection I want to make sure to get to, the, to today is that the modern Enneagram is not scientifically validated. This is a one that I've been hearing a lot lately. Okay, it's a big objection. Uh, in my research, I found that there has been a lot of studies done seeking to validate the enneagram, but many of them are smaller. I found a lot of PhD students doing dissertations on the enneagram, and Dave, Dr. David Daniels, uh, when he was alive, uh, did probably the largest study, to my knowledge, um, on this. But really, none of these, that study and none of, none of the other studies out there are really good enough to make us say, hey, look, it's scientifically valid now, and now we can hang our hats on it. But, but here's where I'd push back to those who completely dismiss uh, the Enneagram because it's not scientifically validated enough. And, and I would say that it's because no one owns the Enneagram, right? Think about this. If you're a company like Gallup, and you are going to create this next Strengths Finder book, and you have the potential to earn hundreds of millions of dollars, then it would be advantageous to spend a few million dollars on research and development, on a little R&D, right? If you're a company and develop a tool with the potential to gain a lot of money, then it makes sense to spend a lot of money on a grand scale to prove its validity. However, if I, Tyler, personally decided to invest a few, few million dollars tomorrow on an Enneagram study, on a nationwide Enneagram study, guess how much money I'd make? Like close to zero, right? Maybe some book sales because my name would get out there, 
but I sure definitely would not get my millions back. And so my short answer as to why the Enneagram hasn't been scientifically validated is because it's so unique in that no one owns it. Like no one owns the Enneagram and has put up the resources to, to do so. Like I said, Dr. David Daniels uh, made an attempt and a few others, but we just, you know, no one owns it. Um, and so here's my advice. It's just because a massive expensive study hasn't been done yet doesn't mean that we should just throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? The mainstream and the church shunned uh, Copernicus and Galileo for claiming that the sun, not the earth, was the center of the universe before it could be scientifically proven. Just because they couldn't prove it yet didn't mean it wasn't true, right? We knew it to be true. And most scientific and medical discoveries that are proven at some point in time, right, in the beginning had their roots in anecdotal evidence first, right, which then leads to a hypothesis that then gets proven through rig rigorous testing over time, right, in a lab. And so psychology and sociology, those two fields, right, are largely based on anecdotal evidence, which is just evidence based on individual experiences and observations repeated over time, as opposed to empirical data-driven evidence, okay? And the reason for this is because much of psychology, as we know, is under the surface. It's looking at our underlying motivations. And so it's really hard to scientifically validate those things that are under the hood, so to speak. And so just to demand an inerrant level of scientific proof uh, for the, for the, in, for the, Enneagram in the area of psychology, I think it's just unrealistic. All right. Uh, and so you're going to keep seeing those articles that it's not scientifically validated. And so therefore it's not, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, unbelievable. Just, uh, I just don't think there's that much weight to that. Okay. Additionally, I want to point out that all of us as human beings make life decisions based on anecdotal evidence all the time. So for example, when you were looking for a romantic partner, there is no proper scientific way to validate what kind of person would suit you best. There's no way to scientifically validate that your potential spouse uh, is, you know, is, is true for you, right? You have to rely on your own experience and the experiences of others on anecdotal evidence, right? So it's, in my humble opinion as a pastor, it's not a sin, I believe, for a Christian to learn from knowledge that hasn't been scientifically validated yet or at least on the level of proof that the naysayers are demanding, okay? Now, should we use everything that we learn outside the Bible or all knowledge outside the Bible? Absolutely not. Uh, that's why we have the Holy Spirit. That's why we have wisdom. Uh, that's why we have community to figure things out, of testing things, and which things are helpful, and which things are not helpful, right? But at the end of the day, right, I personally have found the Enneagram to be transformative in my life and in the lives of the people I'm working with. Right, whether it's friends, whether it's business teams, whether it's premarital counseling, it has been so helpful. I see results. I see progress. It's specific. It's concrete. It's eerily accurate. And I keep seeing results repeatedly over time. And that's why I'm going to keep using the Enneagram and through a Christian worldview. Okay, that's, that's key. And I believe, like many of you, that all truth is God's truth. And that God has given us what's called common grace. He's bestowed knowledge on both believers and unbelievers, right? It's a common grace. If you haven't heard of that before, it's the belief that God abundantly pours out knowledge in spheres of science and medicine and psychology and all kinds of other fields on, on humankind uh, to take advantage simply take to, to take advantage of that knowledge simply because God is compassionate in pouring out knowledge to all people. And I love what uh, Pastor Tim Keller says here. He says, without an understanding of common grace, and I put this in my, my PDF, so some of you have read this. But without an understanding of common grace, Christians may feel no need to study the world and other human cultures in order to get to know God. But the fact is that we need to appreciate truth and wisdom wherever we find it, and that studying different cultures, languages, artwork, and music expands not only our appreciation of the created world, but also the God who made it. I love this quote, and it really resonates with me. Um, but not all Christians believe it. Not all Christians believe that we can learn anything outside the Bible. And so in my article, Should Christians Use the Enneagram that I, I just mentioned, 
which by the way, you can find on my website, gospel Just go and download it. Uh, I mentioned that there are two opposite errors that Christians fall into. Okay, one error is to be a separated Christian, where you separate yourself from the culture, believing that only truth the only truth available is found in the Bible and that everything else is unreliable. Okay, and there are some churches and Christians and Christian Christian subcultures that really close themselves off to society and don't really trust anything. On the other hand, another error is that some Christians become assimilated and are so assimilated to the culture and so open-handed with all knowledge that they just conform to the culture and just take everything in as truth with no filter. And that's not what I'm advocating. I'm advocating a middle ground of being an engaged Christian, right? Who's not separated from culture, but is engaged in culture, who still believes that truth uh, comes from the Bible and believes in the authority of the Bible above all, but still leaves room to glean from wisdom outside the Bible, as long as it helps us to know God, helps us to know ourselves, and helps us to be transformed into the image of Christ. Okay. Um, and so I know we covered a lot today, and um, there's going to be probably more questions that come up. But hey, we're a community. We're going to continue to dive into these objections and talk about them together. Um, but hey, if you benefited from this, uh, would you go and share it on YouTube with your family, friends, and clients? I'm going to be uh, able to send this, this recording out. And so if you benefited from it, get it out into the hands of your clients, friends, family members. Um, you can also make sure to jump on my Instagram account, uh, gospel for Enneagram. That's gospel, F-O-R, for Enneagram. Uh, there's free content every week. Uh, there's a growing community over there, 40,000 uh, people that are dialoguing about these things. And so uh, let's let's keep talking on social media. If you're a podcaster and want to discuss anything uh, that I've mentioned today, hey, I'm, I'm willing to jump on and on an episode and, and talk more about this uh, with the people that you're influencing. Um, and before you go, before the rest of you go, let me tell you that all of this is just the tip of the iceberg. Okay, it's just one thing to spend 45 minutes talking about these objections. It's a whole other thing to dive in and spend weeks uh, studying uh, this. And, and I've tried to do that with my e-course. Okay, In my e-course, you'll get to discover the ancient influence of the Enneagram and get introduced to Homer, uh, Pythagoras, uh, Evagrius, Raymond Lowell, Dante, uh, and Athanasius Kircher. Right. We'll also cover the life of George Gurdjieff, Oscar Chazo, Claudio Naranjo in depth. I got video clips of Naranjo. I have extended quotes from Naranjo and Chazo that, again, help make everything more clear uh, and kind of back up some of the things I've shared today. Uh, we'll also look at how the Enneagram worldview is different than a Christian one. And we'll look at important topics like the image of God, sin, salvation, sanctification, and truth, and uh, so much more. Okay, so uh, click the link below to browse the syllabus for the course and go sign up. All right, go sign up uh, and check this out. I have a special deal for those who are watching this webinar live. If you sign up in the next 24 hours for that course, I will take $20 off the price of the class. Okay, $20 off the price of the class. Just use the discount co code webinar. All right. Uh, I know this course is going to be an investment for some of you. Um, but I feel like you can't put a price on this because, hey, it's the only course that I know of on the web that unpacks the full history of the Enneagram, okay? And B, it's the only course on the web that I think is going to help you learn how to clearly and concisely answer Enneagram objections as a Christian when your friends, family, professors, pastors start asking you about it, okay? I've spent the entire summer researching the origins of the Enneagram, so you don't have to. So you don't have to scour the, inter the internet like I did. Uh, and so I'm so excited to be able to do this class and share so much more with, from you. Uh, we have 20 seats available. I think there's about eight left or so for this first live course, but I'm going to continue to package this as a course and get it out there so more people can feel equipped to have more clarity and confidence in using the Enneagram. All right, so thank you so much for tuning in today. I love that you joined me, and I can't wait to keep doing this important work with you. And so again, if you have any positive feedback, constructive feedback on what I've said, additions that you think would be helpful or any errors that I made, uh, which could totally have happened, I'd be more than happy to hear those from you. So just shoot me a DM or email. Uh, I would love to chat. So, okay, take care and I will see you soon.